talking about the future is always difficult. Um, I had the opportunity about two weeks ago to spend some time in Churchill College in Cambridge. And I walked through some of the museums for, for Churchill there, a man that I always admired because of his um, statesmanship, his uh, ability to be a military strategist, but mostly because of what a good orator he's been. At one point, Winston Churchill was asked what the qualities are that a politician requires. And he said, typically of Churchill, the ability to foretell what is going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. And then he added, and to have the ability afterwards to explain why it didn't happen. <laughs> and this is basically what happens when you start talking about the future. I said to Noah when he came down, he said he put down a very good baseline, but he had to be factual. I have the benefit of, or the freedom to speculate tonight about the future. We choose the term future thinking because it's not future studies, it's not prediction. It is a way of thought, it's a way of living when we deal with the future. And let us look tonight at a few things that will shape industrial engineering of tomorrow. So as I go through this presentation, think of what you do and think how this will impact on what you're going to do in future. Oh, by the way, the other thing I saw when I looked at good properties of an after-dinner speech is they say never use PowerPoint. So I'm not going to do a standard PowerPoint presentation here. I'm going to use a, a picture backdrop to illustrate some of the stuff that I'm talking about. But why future thinking? We all apply strategic thinking in our businesses to reduce uncertainty and to minimize risk and to maximize competitiveness. But what lies beyond strategy? Strategy is like playing chess. You should have a strategy, otherwise you will not be able to play good chess. But what happens if the chess, bo chess board changes tomorrow? What happens if that chess board is suddenly round? or it suddenly has 256 squares on it, then we cannot use the strategies that we had. So beyond strategy lies the future. The future is not predictable. Nobody can tell you that they can predict the future. Neither is it predetermined. And because it is not predetermined, we can influence it in the way we manage today. When we look at the future, we look at three aspects. We look at technology that's emerging. And some of these technologies, although they may be on the horizon, have the potential to be very disruptive. So disruptive that they can turn around whole industries. So we need to know what the technology trends are and the impacts it's going to have on the way we live and we play and we do transactions. Then we look at the behavior of people. The behavior of people in the marketplace and the behavior of people inside the workspace. Because that changes at an astounding uh, rate and it will definitely influence the way we're going to do business tomorrow. And then we look at events that will change the world and we had some of them tonight mentioned. Brexit, uh, a coup in Turkey, uh, the possibility of having three of the largest NATO countries now under new management, um, with people using new approaches uh, than we were used to. And when we look at this triangle of technology, behavior, and events, we can almost form a lens and, and, and look at what's going to happen to the future. So I want to show you a few things tonight which I do believe will influence the way we practice industrial engineering. The first is mind time travel. And I'm not going Star Wars or I'm not going beam me up Scotty here. Then I want to say something quickly about complexity, talk about new oceans and new tsunamis, talk about new humans and non-humans. I've coined the phrase technovolution, which I will explain later. I'll mention something about ingested intelligence, which will make you shake your heads. I want to talk about clutter spaces and open spaces, talk about Methuselahs, and I want to show you that 
Paul Kruger is part of the future more than of the past. I want to talk about Imagine, digital democracy, future thinking and how it leads us to tomorrow's industrial engineering. The theory of mind time basically says that there's a part of the brain which is called the hippocampus. That's not the university where hippopotamuses go to, but it's apparently something you and I have in our brains. And that holds our episodic memory. That is the memory of things that we've experienced and we can go back to and we can recall that. And we can actually very, very vividly recall a nice holiday you had on the beach or a nice experience you had, a nice conversation, a nice coffee you drank somewhere or a good bottle of red wine. Then we have seen or event construction, which we can all do in our brains. That's part of our imagination. And we can link this to a certain space, which gives us spatial navigation. That very same part of the brain enables us to do future thinking, which is the ability to project ourselves into the future, to pre-experience an event. And we should train ourselves to pre-experience that event in the same way that we can go back in memory and recall an event that we enjoyed. All of that together gives us the semantic memory we have, which is our knowledge of the world. And Nua spoke about how we deal with knowledge and the perceptions we have about knowledge of the present and the past. And this actually gives us a very good connection point to what he said earlier tonight. Because in mind time travel, we know the now, which is present thinking. We will remember the past, and we can project ourselves into the future. And then why do we do these things? What does it mean to us? Remembering means that we have things like evidence. We have accuracy, we have proof. Trust, caution, and all the other things that I've written up there. Knowing the, the present means that we can have results, we can complete things, we can put order to things, we can balance situations, we can find stability and continuity. And this is what we do in our everyday practices of how we do our work. But being able to project ourselves into the future, we prepare ourselves for change, we can do original thinking, we can see possibility, we have hope, we can innovate, we can generate ideas, we can seek opportunity, we can follow our curiosity, we can imagine, we can vision, and we can be flexible. And if you combine all three of these and we move from the one to the other to the other, we can actually do this mind-time travel, which we do require to take ourselves into the future. Let me just say something very quickly about complexity. You may be familiar with, um, with Dave Snowden's um, four quadrants of the world explaining order and unorder and disorder. First of all, there's a simple world. That's a known world where there's visible order and where things are obvious. And that's where we get best practice. Then there's a knowable world. That is the hidden order or discoverable world. That is where, for those of us that do research, go and find solutions that we don't have in the simple present world. This is where we find good practice. Then we move into complexity, and this is where there's only respectively coherent issues. There's emergence of patterns. Um, and we cannot really predict or understand necessarily before we react uh, to, to operate in this complex world. And that is where we find emergent practice. And then there's chaos, where everything is incoherent, where there's no obvious patterns. And obviously there are ways of moving from the one to the other to stabilize the environment. But in essence, um, the one is, as I said, unorder, the other is order, and then you have in between a space which is called disorder where you don't want to be. Future thinking is really about being able to operate outside the simple and the complicated or discoverable worlds into the complex and the chaotic worlds. And we have to apply that kind of thinking more and more in the way we deal with our everyday challenges and opportunities that we have. The next thing I want to talk about is new oceans and new tsunamis. Very much like the seafarers of the ancient times, we have to get into uncharted waters to either find new resources or to find new markets. 
There are huge waves that we may not know very well in these uncharted waters. There are also some spectacular tsunamis which we have to prepare ourselves for. You might have seen this before, and this is basically the economic value that nations grow economies on. And we had the agricultural economy, the resource-based economy, the industrial economy over time. These things typically follow the S-curve. Um, there's the information economy, there's bioeconomy, nanoeconomy, and the hydroeconomy that we speak about. You will notice that I do not have the knowledge economy there. At the moment, we're challenged by the confluence of all seven of these economies. And this is called the knowledge era. And the knowledge economy is really a combination of these other economies where we find value. But there's another one emerging, one that people don't talk about a lot that I think we have to start taking note of. And this is called the neuroeconomy. And this is the economy where we understand the human brain so well that we can build machines that can complement the human brain or we can build machines that are as smart or smarter than humans. And to do that, we have to understand very well what we're doing because we will then jump from what is called the knowledge era to the era of the algorithm. And we will hear more and more about this in future. Those are the waves, but there are also tsunamis. And these tsunamis I compare with the emerging or disrupting technologies. And many of them you are very aware of. But think about them combined when they all play a dominant role in our lives. There's a power of social media, and I'll point out later what that means in terms of also political power. There's mobile life and apps. Everything we do today, we can almost do on our cell phones in our pockets. There's augmented reality where you put the digital world on top of the physical world. And to a large extent, this will determine research and development in future because the information will be superimposed on the subject that you study. There's geospatiality in the fact that everything today has an address, so you can find it and describe it. There's the cloud. You're processing your storage separated. Um, you don't know where your data sits, but you still have access to it. There's big data. But at the same time, we should say the importance of small data should not be underestimated. There's a lot of emphasis on big data today, specifically also coming from social media. There's genetic engineering which holds wonderful opportunity for what we're going to do in terms of medical um, services for the future. In my opinion, one of the most disruptive technologies that we will see in future is 3D printing. It's already changing the whole landscape of manufacturing, where we used to say it's the raw materials uh, provider that needs to add value through manufacturing. We can go back to saying that Whoever will have the control will be the raw material suppliers because the manufacturing will be done at point of use. And this will revolutionize the whole manufacturing industry. What is more, it's going to be, the money is going to be in the design and the algorithm that you're going to sell for whoever will do that manufacturing. And it's not only additive manufacturing as we know it, in the aeronautical environment, for example. It is specifically in the medical world where live li or living tissue out of your own body will be used to grow organs that you need to transplant your organs with. It's going to revolutionize the food industry, the cake baking industry. It already had an impact on the fashion industry where you can think it, wear it, because you can make a pair of shoes in the morning if you thought about a nice design while you couldn't sleep last night. There's the Internet of Things and what that will mean because everything will be connected to everything else and everything will be able to control everything else. There's the world of microfluidics and nanofluidics where you have a body on a chip and you don't have to do clinical trials that will take six months or, uh, or longer. But you can instantaneously, as you develop a drug, test it because you can simulate the human body in microfluidics. There's virtuality, which basically means a place without a space. It does include virtual reality, which is a wonderful tool that we are seeing entering the consumer market, where you can take your cell phone, 
put it in a pair of goggles, put it on, and have a virtual 3D experience. Modeling simulation. The world of virtuality is with us and it's going to change our lives forever. There's biomimicry, where we look at nature and we adapt our designs to do things better because nature has learned that over millions and millions of years. There's a world of drones that will change logistics, that will change our supply chains, it will change delivery. Amazon is already working on delivering whatever you, you order from Amazon. It's not only the tactical drones, it's not only the, 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 the drones with sensors on it uh, that we use on our borders to protect our rhinos. It's going to be an everyday thing. It has revolutionized photography. And then there's part of this neuroeconomy, uh, neuroengineering. There's a project at the moment in Europe being run, which is called the Human Brain Project. It's like the Human Genome Project, where they're going to understand the structure of the brain and neurons to such an extent that they can build better computers. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating in terms of what it's going to do to our lives. These are the tsunamis on the oceans that we, that we navigate on. And then there's something like space tourism. SpaceX from, from Elon Musk, Musk um, and, and, and also the um, company from, um, from, from Richard Branson. The interesting thing about space exploration today, it is not controlled by the NASA's and the European space agencies of this world. It is controlled by private companies. I was on Orlando uh, about six, seven weeks ago. I did not go to the Kennedy Space Center or, or, or uh, Cape Canaveral, but the launching pads there now belong to private companies. And I think that's a major shift in terms of where that technology is going. Let me talk about new humans and non-humans. And I'll take you out of the mystery just now on the non-human one. I said we look at the behavior of people in terms of what they do in the marketplace and what they do in organizations. As consumers, we behave differently. The marketing people will tell you that. And there are the age groups, the baby boomers, you can put yourself in it, the Generation Xs, and then the millennials, which is a combination of Generation Y, Generation G, or Generation Z, as some people call it. If you look at influence versus buying power, the graph looks like that. Generation G and Y, the young people that are still in school or just entering the workspace now, have all the influence, but they do not have the buying power. The buying power sits with us old folks because we've worked for a while. But we cannot influence the market that much. You actually get a shift now that, you know, who's the client and who's the user? Think of yourself walking into a toy shop. Who's the client, who's the user? Uh, the user would be the generation Gs and Ys, and the clients would be the baby boomers. So those are some shifts in, in the consumer market, but also inside the workplace. If we look at leadership against values, there's a major shift that we see. Leadership is now shifting from command and control to coordinate and cultivate. Values are shifting from the workplace, which is a physical venue where people go to and look busy, to the workspace where people really work, regardless of where they are. And there the curve looks the other way around. The baby boomers like to work in the workplace and have authority. The Generation Gs will not have offices. They will work from where they are. They also love to coordinate and cultivate leadership. That means that the corporate ladder has now fallen over. And instead of having autocracy, where we were leading from the top, we will now have holacracy, where we will be leading from the side. And the interesting thing is that there will be a mix of these generations forever in our businesses. Hollywood has exposed us to cyborgs, and we still think of them as science fiction. You know what a cyborg is? It's a, it's a human body that's augmented by an implant or by a structure or a by a bionic uh, addition. The question is, has artificial intelligence become a threat for workers? And I never thought about this until I gave a similar talk to a group of engineering students at Stellenbosch University and they were lying on beanbags, they were not sitting in a lecture room, and they were asking me, 
those, those that were awake were asking me, do you really think that machines will take over from us? And I said, you look, too, look at too many Hollywood movies. And then I started thinking about this and the result I'll show you. If we look at cyborgs at work, some of you might have read this book by Ray Kurzweil, which is called The Singularity is Near. You know that a singularity is a point where things get uh, so dense that there's a, a permanent change. And that point that he's talking about is the point where machines may take over from humans. If we just look at what is called the Kurzweil curve, and he might have inherited it from other people as well, um, what we're plotting here is the computer performance in terms of calculations per second per $1,000. In other words, a computer that will cost less than $1,000 will have certain powers. In 2001, computers had the power of one insect brain. In 2010, it had the power of one mouse brain. In 2023, it will have the power of one human brain. And in 2050, it will have the power of all human brains. And this is what Kurzweil is talking about as the potential singularity. This makes us realize that we have to look at human-machine partnerships. And I think it was Hassan that said earlier that industrial engineering is really about the interface between humans and machines. So we have to start thinking about human-machine interfaces, not only interfaces, but real partnerships. How do we work together with machines? And talk about things like the automatability of activities instead of replacing people with machines. We will have to start preparing ourselves for creativity, for intuition, for ethics, for motivation, for a conscience maybe in machines. So we have to think away from just automation to co-thinking, to human-machine algorithms. How do we do our work together and not as separate entities? To human-machine relationships, think about labor relationships. It's a whole new dimension now. To autonomous machine decision making, where well, yes, the machine can become the boss. For co-learning, what will happen to remuneration? Will machines expect to be paid? Will we corrupt their thinking with economic systems? What will we do with our machines? And then, will we get together with our human rights lawyers, machine right lawyers, now, you may see that this is going a bit extreme, but you sometimes have to go over the edge when you start talking about the future. The question is, will us as humans be able to absorb all of this? Will our psyches be prepared for a world like this? And this is where I came up with the word technovolution, just to look at what is happening. You will recognize Darwin there, the father of biological evolution understanding. If we take a time scale of about two and a half billion years ago until the present. And in those days, two and a half billion years ago, the continents were not separated yet. It was only about 50 million years ago that we had the continental drift and the, the Earth looked like it looks today. Life could best be described two and a half billion years ago as drops of chemicals that learned to record information. And the way they recorded that information was very much like you, uh, your and my DNA does it today. But these were individual um, entities. Then communities formed where DNA got exchanged and multicellular organisms evolved. But these had no central nervous systems. That came later. And the central nervous system could record, understand, and communicate. That led to certain species, and this is where Darwin came in and said there's natural selection and the strongest will survive. And then came Homo sapiens, where we've now speeded up evolution to such an extent that learning take place, takes place in one lifetime. So what have we done? We started to build technology to help us to communicate over distance, to help us to understand and record by adding computers where complexity is now taken over by the machine. And we are now at the point where we have an intelligence surplus in machines, where machine selection, machine decision 
can actually take place. What has happened from evolution over two and a half billion years, we've grown to one human lifetime of about 100 years maximum where we, we learn, of less than 10 years in a technology life cycle to less than one microsecond where machine decisions are being made. So the change is not even exponential. The rate of change looks something like that red line there. It's almost instantaneous. How do we cope with this? How do we, how do we offer solutions? How do we keep people sane in a world like that? We talk about events, trends that we watch, long-term events. Some of them can be prevented, some of them can be influenced, some of them um, disappear very quickly, some of them combine and form major impacts. But the definite trend, and we'll also re refer to it, is migration. Not only migration from remote areas to other continents like Europe is, is experiencing at the moment, but specifically migration into cities. And we talk about cluttered spaces and we talk about the open spaces. Today, more than 50% of people live in cities. In future, over the next 50 years, more than 75% will. They say it's going to take the same time to build an entire city that it's taking today to build a bridge. And this is the reality that we're going to sit with a new combination, a new grouping, a new self-organization of humanity in cities rather than in countries. And I often, tongue in the cheek, ask the question, are we moving back to the feudal system because of the power that cities will have? What does it mean for engineering? It means that in our clutter spaces, we have to start thinking about green buildings. Yes, we are. We have to start looking at energy generation buildings. Yes, we do. We have to start thinking of not only catching water with a building, but also storing with a building. So a building will become an independent system, an independent entity that would give us life. We will have kinetic power as we walk on sidewalks through piezoelectric materials. We will generate electricity that will switch on um, shop windows, that will switch on the lights where we want to go next. Vertical farms are being experimented with, where you can feed an entire city by using hydroponics in high-rise buildings. Our underground management systems will have to improve, specifically for waste management. We have to look at health and wellness where people cluster together like that. And we will have new forms of transport. And we already see in which direction these new forms of transport are going. Um, we know that it would be driverless vehicles. We know that it would be electrical vehicles. We know that it would be smaller. So our whole transport systems uh, will, will definitely change, and the weak signal, not even the weak signals, the strong, the signals are there already. What will happen to our open spaces? I don't know, digital detox maybe? Go away for that weekend, run away from all the machines and breathe again. You can work from anywhere, so I don't know why people cluster in cities. I think it's the, the herd um, aspect of the human animal that, that want to cluster together. It's not because of work anymore. Uh, maybe it's a security system, uh, maybe it has something to do with power. And hopefully our for forests will replenish as well. Many of you might have heard <clears throat> about Nicholas Negroponte. He's a guy that started MIT Media Lab. And in 2014 they had a TED um, talk where Negroponte was asked about the past 30 years of technology. And we, MIT Media Lab played a major role in putting new technology forward. And then just before he walked off the stage, they asked him, Nicholas, what would you say would be the most dramatic change in the next 30 years? He thought for a while and he said, ingested intelligence. What he meant with that is he said, you will get a pill, a knowledge pill, that you will swallow and you will have the knowledge. If you want to speak English, you will swallow an English pill. And if you want to know the works of Shakespeare, you will swallow the works of Shakespeare. And I have this reaction that I have now whenever I speak about it. And I thought, is it really so crazy? Because futurists sometimes do get crazy. And I thought, but how did we learn? And how are we learning at the moment? Human to human, professor speaking to students, me talking to you, it's, it's talk and listen. That's from ancient times, storytelling, the way that we've been learning. 
But we had machine-human interfaces as well, and many of them are up there. And the more modern ones are the chip to brain, where I said this neuro economy will probably start playing a major role, and hopefully that computer will be a DNA chip, so there would be a very good interface with a brain. But what is wrong with chemical human interfaces? If we look at the progress that we're seeing in brain medicine nowadays, if you look at the progress they see with, for example, treating Alzheimer's disease, so is the knowledge pool so far-fetched? And can we have ingestive learning? But let's leave that there. That may be the extreme future. What is real is that people are getting older and they still make a meaningful impact. You know about Methuselah in the Bible. He became 169 years old and then he died. Today, almost one in 10 people are over 60 years old. By 2050, one in five people will be over 50. Oh, sorry, over 60. And people age over 60 will outnumber children age 15 by 2050. That's in the world. It's not necessarily true for a continent like Africa. What does this mean? A lower birth rate is causing world population to slow down. I listened to Hans Rosling from Sweden, where he makes a calculation that we are at seven something billion now and we will not exceed nine billion in the world and then the population will stabilize and start um, going down again. Entire nations may see culture shifts as a result of migration, as a result of fewer younger people coming in. There will be a strain on health, pension, social security systems. People will work longer before retirement. Therefore, I said the Paul Krugers will be part of the future. Disease epidemiology will shift from non-communicable and chronic, chronic diseases. And new technologies and services will focus on aged people. If we talk about geopolitical conflict and geopolitical change, we have to think back of the 1960s when that man, who many of you probably recognize, John Lennon, in 1971 or so, wrote the song Imagine. He wrote the whole song and the lyrics in one, in one go, in his flat one morning. And this phrase from it is well known where in the second verse he says, imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Despite our quest for peace, geopolitical complexity and risk are driven by economics and emotion. Religious tensions and intolerance breed new realms of terrorism. Was mentioned, ISIS was mentioned here earlier tonight. Financial systems are not operating normally and need to be redefined. 2008 showed us that in the world. Cybercrime and cyber warfare, practiced by states and criminals alike, are a reality likely to cause global disruption. I read the other day that the, the total value of money in cybercrime today is more than the combined defense budgets in the world. You've heard about the dark web recently when some places were cracked by hackers. Um, there's a whole separate world operating that many of us that live ordinary lives know very little about, and that's the world of cybercrime. It's almost a parallel world, parallel universe. Democracy is being redefined. We see that in South Africa. We see it all over the world, and I'll show you examples now. And the future of the nation state may, may be at risk. You mentioned the nation, nation state. When I say this, I'm saying not it's the feudal system that's going to come back to us. I'm saying the individual is going to become so sovereign that they may not need governments or states, and they may look after themselves. Let us look at an example. The sovereign individual is on the rise. I call it digital democracy. A couple of years ago, 2011, we had the so-called Arab Spring. Last year in October, we had our own, what I call, student spring. With hashtag, and you can fill in whatever you want to, must go, except that certain things don't go away. But it's, it's against injustice. It's, it's mass action, it's mass collaboration, and all of this is being assisted or organized on social media, like that picture of the little girl there while she's in the demonstration at Grahamstown University 
calls her friends in or communicates out to the press or whatever. So the eyes of the world is being pulled into this. And what has happened in South Africa with our student spring is that Generation Y is speaking. And the world and the government specifically started listening. What has happened last week? Several references to that. Turkish, coup. What comes over Sky News? I was watching this, and as I was watching this, I took these photos, not very good, with my cell phone off the screen. The Turkish president said, and the public should continue to stay in charge of the streets. So here we had a military uprising, and on the photograph on your right, we had citizens from the street pulling soldiers from an army tank and saying this must stop. So the dimension of war is changing. It's not the way we've been thinking about war. It's the citizen that becomes the individual that becomes sovereign and decides what democracy means for them. What we say here is that we can look at the future through events, technology, and behavior. Let's put a little bit of pseudo-mathematics to it. Technology means physical things. Behavior means perception of people. And events is what happens. Change is now a function of physical things plus perception, plus what happens. Future thinking is really the integration of change over time. And strategy is the summation of future thinking. This is how we get to many of these things that we put together and say, they're going to influence our future. If you start spinning that triangle, you get the perfect lens, and I'm not going into the mechanics of that lens now. But if we look at that lens through industrial engineering without doing a proper analysis, there are a few things I think we should take note of. The business landscape um, is moving away from us. It's moving into the future. The past that we heard about from Noor is what we understand well. That's the known world. The present may be more complex, but this is where we live. This is where many of us get stuck, according to what Noor said. But this is where we make decisions. And nobody can really live in the future. But what we're saying is we can look at the shape of that evolving future landscape by looking at technologies that emerge, by looking at events, and by looking at behavior. The interface between the present and the future is the edge of disruption. And it's in that edge of disruption that we practice our industrial engineering. We said as human beings we have this capability, we just have to practice it sometimes, that we can move from the past to the present to the future and back. We call it mind time travel. By doing that, we can actually claim a piece of the future. In fact, because it's not predetermined, we can influence that future. We can, we can do something today to make a preferred future happen. That means we have to do backcasting and we have to come back to our strategies, knowing that the chessboard may change as we go along playing the game. This is basically what the future thinking philosophy brings forward in terms of strategic thinking. I had the opportunity of listening to David Tees uh, two weeks ago, uh, and I asked myself, are there three things about the future that organizations will have to give attention to that I've recently heard a lot of? The one is dynamic capabilities. If you are not able to shape your capabilities dynamically in your organization, you may not survive. You will not become a leader. The other one is what David Tees calls complements. Complements are basically platforms. They can be technology platforms. They can be systems or processes that coexist in your environment. Unless you balance them and let the one get power from the other one, you will not survive in the future. And the other one is that we should maybe stop talking about strategies and rather talk about business model innovation. Because a business model is about the value that you provide your customer. Can you do rapid business model innovation? Because if you cannot do that, the agility is gone in this demanding future. What does this mean in terms of future industrial engineering drivers? I'm just going to leave you with a few words. We will have to understand and practice and allow innovation. We will have to look at cognition and decision-making, at next-generation products and services, 
We will have to do some breakthrough thinking. We will have to have a culture of trial and error and forgive mistakes, not punish mistakes. Sometimes encourage mistakes. Instead of having hardware and software, we'll have to start thinking of brainware and coware, specifically if we bring the machines in as partners. Computational IE has been and will forever be an important focus area. We need to work in complex systems and networks. We have to go over to the world of unorder and work in that emerging environment where we sometimes have to act before we understand. We have to find new ways of customer value, and that we will do with this agile um, business model innovation. The principle of lean everywhere will become stronger, and we will have to give attention to the cyclic economy while also bringing in things like biomimicry and so on. What are five questions to take us forward to industrial engineering of tomorrow? How comfortable are we with a fast-changing landscape on which we operate? Or do we wish it away? How easy can we travel in mind time? Can we thrive in complexity? Are we building the mind of the future in our industrial engineering teaching? And are we allowing these future young minds to influence our way of work? It was the same Churchill I referred to earlier that said, the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. I want to thank you for your interest in the future.